The Cavalcade of America. Americans are familiar with the names of those courageous early American explorers, Lewis and Clark, who are two of the characters in tonight's broadcast of the Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont. Lewis and Clark launched their expedition into the wilds of the Northwest in 1804, but even then, the DuPont Company had established its first chemical factory in Delaware. The stories of exploration are bright pages in the history of the nation. Important also is another kind of exploration. The kind that takes place in chemical laboratories like those of DuPont, where the exploration results in better things for better living through chemistry. Our first story this evening takes place in the early days of the 19th century in the vast wilderness west of the Mississippi. Our cavalcade orchestra sets the stage with Charles Wakefield Cadman's song, from the land of the sky blue water, which is based on an American Indian theme. to explore has come to us naturally, for the very foundation of our nation was through exploration. Columbus, Cabot, De Soto, Hudson, John Smith, Coronado, La Salle, from those intrepid adventurers we received this heritage. In the year 1803, Thomas Jefferson, then President of the United States, obtained an appropriation from Congress for the exploration of the newly purchased territory lying west of the Mississippi and extending to the Pacific Ocean. As leader of the expedition, he appointed his young secretary, Meriwether Lewis, who seized upon a task with great zeal. He chose as his partner and co-leader William Clark, brother of George Rogers Clark of revolutionary fame. On March 14, 1804, a brave company, 45 in number, started up the Missouri River. 
We find them at La Charette, the last outpost of civilization, talking with the chief magistrate of that settlement, a brave pioneer himself, Daniel Boone. Wish I were young enough to go with you, Captain Lewis. I wish so too, sir. Hey, Clark. Yes, indeed, Mr. Boone. Oh, one of our men was telling us how he fought with you, a fellow by the name of Gordon Cameron. The old Scott. I know him well. Hey there. Hey. Ain't that his voice? Yes, Captain Lewis. Captain Lewis. I'm uh, here, Cameron, with Mr. Boone. Eh, not Daniel Boone. Eh, Daniel. Yes. Oh, yes. an old friend, and happy to see you again. The guide says the wind is right, Captain, and we better be starting. We're ready. Who is your guide, Captain Lewis? A Frenchman. Toussaint Charbonneau. Aye, a Frenchman with an Indian wife. A wife he insists on taking on the expedition. Charbonneau says that Sacagawea Weir is a better guide than he is himself. A woman for a guide. A woman on the expedition brings bad luck. Don't mind Cameron's growling, Captain Lewis. Oh, I don't Come, know. I'll walk with you to your boat. How fast do you aim to travel? Well, with luck, 15 miles from sun to sun. Luck, indeed. We have a woman on the party. Ah, yes, and here she is with her husband. Uh, this is Charbonneau, Mr. Boone, and his wife. Howdy, Howdy Charbonneau. Mm-hmm. Uh, what tribe is your wife from, Charbonneau? The Chauchons, monsieur. It's a child, the Blackfeet tribe, the Steeler. I buy her from them. How called you her name? I am called Sakajawea, a bird woman. Mm, you are very young to be guiding this expedition, my child. May your eye be clear and your senses keen, for upon you and Charbonneau rests a great responsibility. Westward, the daring adventurers struggled against turbulent waters and virgin forests, against hostile savages, death-bearing insects, wild animals, heat, rain, cold. As the year went on, a son was born to Charbonneau and Sacagawea. Over a year passes. It is June, 1805. We find Captain Lewis with Cameron, Charbonneau, Sacagawea, and her papoose standing in a ravine beneath an overhanging rock where they have sought shelter from a torrential rain. When she rains so, this brook, she soon become a raging torrent. Yeah, there's no saying what may happen with a woman on the party. And no with a bear. Uh, surely we're safe here. Often I see angry waters carry huge rocks and trees before them, bringing death to all in their path. Even as she comes now. You hear? Aye, I hear it. It is as if a dam had burst. Hold up fast to the captain, wife. Even now, the water covers our feet. Hold fast, Carbon. Oh, you lose your footing. Cameron, give him a hand. Hey, that's primitive. I cannot swim. We must get to the higher ground and quickly. Each moment, the water will still rise. Give me the child, Sacket. So I'll hold him. Thank you, Captain. I... Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, wait, she can't just switch her away. Cameron, hold hey. the child. Hey. Here, Carbon, I'll take my gun and sack. The waters. They're carrying her toward the falls, monsieur. I'll get her. I'm coming, Sacket. Captain, wait. Wait, wait now. Now they'll both be dragged into the rapids. Captain, watch those rocks. Look. He has reached her. Uh, they'll never stand against the torrent. Here, hold the baby. Yes, monsieur. Get it, Captain. Come on. He brings her up. Hold fast. Hurry. I can't hold it much longer. I'm throwing it behind you, Captain. So they'll drift down to you. Here you are. I have it. He has it. Pull, come on. Hey. Pull. Slowly. Ah. Slowly, the rope have cut the rope. Ah. Once more, my brave. One more pull. Uh, we'll make at the same, Captain. But, uh, Come your uh, hand, uh, here, oh. here, here, up on the bank. Oh. Uh, 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 here, right. you. Cameron, you were giving me your cloak. Well, after all the trouble we had to save you, it wouldn't have been sense to let you die of the cold. <laughs> the party reaches the foothills of the Rockies, what is now part of the state of Montana. For days, the expedition searches in vain for a way through or across the huge mountain. Lewis, Cameron, and Sacagawea gaze toward the snow-tipped peaks that bar their path. Mountains. Mountains in all directions. Impassable barriers, that's what they are. Somewhere on the other side of those mountains lies the great Columbia River. Leads to the Pacific. Unless we reach it, our whole expedition is a failure. Hey, yet a woman guide has failed you. Lewis, look. 
Indians coming through the ravine. Yes. Yonder. Yes. Enemies of my people. They outnumber us. Uh, let's face them, Captain. Daniel Boone and I were a match for the five red skins. Let me speak with them. No, uh, no. They are cut here and carried back into slavery again. Let's face them, Captain. Sucker, do we? Wait, Sucker, do we? Come back here. This fleet is a deer, monsieur. Already she is too far away. Someone must follow her. They are black feet, monsieur. They make friends with no one. Every man ready now. The fleet is approaching us. Greetings seem friendly. Maybe treacherous. So. If we have to rescue that woman again, I'll... Quiet, Grandma. Be on guard. I wish I could understand what they're saying. Captain Lewis, these my own people. This is my brother. He did you welcome. Oh. He thanks you for saving my life. Oh. The black sheep drove them from their old hunting grounds. Tell the chief that we are his friends and that we bring gifts and food. Ask if he knows a path through the great mountain. Uh, perhaps he plans to trick us, Captain. You can guess which way a man will jump, but a woman or a red king will come. Well, Sacagawea. Beyond great mountains lies mighty river. River that leads to the sea. Captain, the there is a path by which it may be reached. A great river. The river we seek. I he never show us the way. It is only defense against the black wish. This knows white men are true friends. He will lead white warriors through mountains. A goal is one. Uh, well, come on. Were we wrong now to bring the woman? Uh, to be a mean man who couldn't admit that he was wrong. of November, Lewis and Clark finally sighted the Pacific Ocean. Eighteen months it had taken them to traverse 4,000 miles of wilderness from the mouth of the Missouri to the western shore of the continent. No braver exploiters recorded in the cavalcade of America. second story concerns Greeley's Arctic expedition in 1881. Much of the music of Grieg expresses the composer's impressions of his own Northland. Our cavalcade orchestra will set the scene with morning mood from Grieg's suite, Peer Gimp.
American cavalcade moves onward. The will to explore is still a characteristic trait among Americans. It is July 7th, 1881. Adolphus W. Greeley, 37 years old, lieutenant in the United States Signal Corps, sets off for the Arctic regions with a party of 25 men. The good ship Proteus, designed as a sealing vessel, is almost ready to sail. On the dock, Lieutenant Greeley is bidding a last farewell to his wife. For three years, dear. It's a long time. It won't be three years, Henrietta. Oh, but... At the end of the year, a ship is scheduled to bring us supplies. If we've accomplished our mission, we'll return then. But you told the newspapers you were taking supplies for three years. Well, of course. We must always be on the safe side. Oh, it all seems so terribly far away. Why must my husband go? Why was he chosen? This is a big opportunity for me, darling. There's never been an expedition so well equipped, so sure of reaching its goal. I know. Smile, dear. Smile and wish me good luck. Oh, man, the flight's compliments, Lieutenant. They're ready to cast off. Thank you, Sergeant. Oh. Well, dear, time to go. Where's that smile? Ah, oh, that's better. Well, just come back to me safely. That's all that matters, dear. Goodbye, dear. Goodbye. Kiss the babies for me. I will. Remember, keep smiling. I will. Goodbye. 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 Goodbye, dear. Goodbye. Goodbye. On August 12th, Lieutenant Greeley established headquarters on Discovery Bay, Greenland. The work of surveying and scientific research went on rapidly. Greeley's courageous leadership helped them pass that first long Arctic winter. On May 13, 1882, a sub-expedition under Lieutenant Lockwood planted the stars and stripes farther north than man had ever been before. They returned to Greeley's camp, only to find that no relief ship had arrived. One had been sent out, and six times it had tried to pass through the ice and cane sea, only to be baffled by the flow. The second winter was worse than the first, and the spring brought no promise of better times. They wait for the relief ship that never comes. Trying to keep up their courage, Greeley goes among them. Captain Greeley. Captain Greeley. Yes, Brainerd. Rice and James, the Eskimo, have returned. Yes. They report nothing but open sea on every side. No supplies were found. The last hope, Captain Greeley. Yes, Doctor. Lockwood is asking for you. I'll go with you at once. Brainerd, see that the flag of distress is firmly planted on the highest ground. There might still be a chance. Yes, Captain. Well, Doctor, how is Lockwood today? Very weak, Captain. He's in this tent. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Lockwood. That, that last trip of mine. I, I left the letter. But will, will anyone ever find it? We can only yes. hope, my friend. Yes. Far from anything is the worst. It is easy to die. Very easy. But it's hard to struggle to live. I expected privation, death perhaps, but not abandonment. The thoughts of abandonment preyed on their minds. And while they waited, the Proteus, Greeley's original ship, was sent with supplies, but was crushed in the ice pack. Almost three years after the start of the expedition, through the insistence of Mrs. Greeley, President Arthur sent three vessels, the Thetis, the Bear, and the Alert, the latter a gift from Queen Victoria and the British nation. In August, the Thetis floats amid the ice near Brevoort Island off the Greenland coast. The commander of the relief expedition, Winfield Scott Fly is on deck as Lieutenant Colwell returns to the ship with a searching party. Well, Colwell, report of searching party on Bravoot Island, sir. Fog heavy, bad visibility. No sign of the Greeley party. 
But we did find this paper buried in a spot which was undoubtedly the remains of a supply cache. Give it to me. October 21st, 1883. My party now permanently encamped on west side of small neck of land, distant about equally from Cape Sabine and Cockhead Island. Rations for 40 days. A.W. Greeley. Hmm. Written almost a year ago, and rations were only 40 days. Norman. Yes, sir. Full speed as the ice will permit. Make for Cape Sabine. Yes, sir. Full speed ahead, Bosom. Order the whistle to keep blowing. One man is alive. He may hear it. Yes, sir. of the law. Sergeants Long and Brainerd huddled together beside the one tent, weakened by hunger and exposure. Brainerd. Yes. Don't you hear something? It's only the sound of the ice. I mean, that whistle. Listen. The wind. It's always whistling. I know the wind when I hear it. That's the ship's whistle. Oh, Long, you're a fool. You're going crazy. Crazy or not, I'm going to crawl to the top of the hill with a little strength that's left me. Go ahead if you want. I couldn't make it. Oh, what does it matter? Can't you hear that? Now I hear a voice. Bring it. Bring it. I hear a voice. I've heard it, too. In your own brain. I hear it now. Long, can you see? I've almost reached the edge of the hill. Bring it. It's a boat. Run it. Run it. It's a boat. Steady, steady, old man. Steady. Oh, you're... You're real, aren't you? I've seen you so many times. Only to have you disappear. We're real right enough, eh, Colo? Yes, we sure are. How many have you left? Seven, sir. Where are they? In the tent. There. Behind the bank. Come on, Norman. Hurry. What? Help this man. Come on. Is, uh, is Mr. Greeley alive? Yes, sir. Any other officers? No, sir. And you are... I'm Long, sir. Long? I'm Norman, who came up with you in the Proteus. You remember me. Oh, yes, sir. This is Brainerd. Brainerd? Sir, I... Man, man, don't try to salute. Where's Mr. Greeley? Norman. Norman. Here he is. On the lee side of the tent. Oh, what a sight. Greeley. Greeley, we've... We've come for you. Seven. Seven of us left. Dying. Did what we came to do. Beat the best record. Of course you did, sir. And now we've... We've come to take you home. Home? Yes, sir. You're rescued, sir. Don't you see the ship? Lift me a little. I want to see... the flag. Really, old man. It's Norman. I brought you a message from your wife. She said that when you came home, you'd find her... smiling. carried the survivors back to their country. Greeley lived to receive the praise of his government and later became chief signal officer in the army. His diary and his own published description of his exploits were typical of the man's modesty and courage. No credit was claimed by him. All was given to the men who followed him to the outpost of the law. Heroes like these gallant explorers, Lewis, Clark, Greeley, Brainerd, make us proud to be their countrymen proud of their leadership in the cavalcade of America.
The urge to explore founded our nation, and this same trait today spurs on the research chemists to discover and create useful things. One of the most fascinating examples of exploration in the field of chemistry is the story of man-made rubber. For many years, scientists tried to find the substitute for rubber, but all attempts fell short of their goal until recently when DuPont chemists successfully completed the development of the first successful man-made rubber. DuPont's name for this product is Duprene. Duprene is actually superior to the natural product for many purposes. Products made of Duprene resist heat, sunlight, oils, and various chemicals better than those made with natural rubber, and they do not break down with ages rapidly. We take pride at this time in telling our listeners of an award made last Friday by a special committee of leading figures in the chemical world, sponsored by the publication Chemical and Metallurgical Engineering. In making this award, the committee said, the slogan, Better Things for Better Living Through Chemistry, is a creed that molds and guides the work of thousands of chemists and engineers. The outstanding chemical engineering achievement during the past two years has been DuPont's successful industrial development of the synthetic rubber Duprene, of synthetic camphor, and of certain other important organic chemicals and dye stuffs. We know that many of you would like to see and handle this man-made rubber, so we have had a few erasers made up as samples. They look like, feel like, and do the work of ordinary erasers, but they contain Duprene instead of natural rubber. We shall be glad to send you one of these erasers free of charge. Simply write to DuPont, Wilmington, Delaware, or to your radio station. Now remember, if you would like to see and handle a product made from this man-made rubber, just ask for the eraser made from Duprene by writing DuPont, D-U-P-O-N-T, Wilmington, Delaware, or your radio station. Engineers and businessmen interested in industrial uses for Duprene may secure a special technical sample by writing on their company letterhead, describing the problem to be met. Wednesday at this time, DuPont will again present the Cavalcade of America. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. W-A-B-C, New York.